test, test. Is it okay I take my mask off while I preach? I might not be alive if you don't let me. I tried singing just now and I almost choked to death. So uh, I'm thankful to be, I think I lost my little uh, cover for the microphone. It's in the mask. It fell. Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. I was really fearful this morning that I would not fit into my pants. I have not worn them for six months. You only see the top half of my body. So, uh, God is good. I was watching all of you give your praises this morning, and I was getting very fearful. Please sanitize the mic afterwards, and uh, everyone that touched it and gave a praise, please wash your hands after that, okay? Um, I think our, our ushers need to just uh, hold the microphone, and then uh, we give you 30 seconds and pull away. Um, I am thankful to be back here this morning. It's nice to look at faces and not a camera lens. I'm thankful to be here also because this past week, this is the first time I'm coming out of my house since Monday. I am realized, I, I, I'm reminded of my age as I twisted my ankle while warming up for badminton. I hadn't even played a game yet. <laughs> so I've been bedridden since Monday night. And uh, I'm just so thankful for a wonderful, strong wife that continues to take care of the whole house and keep it humming and uh, running while I'm lying there being served. <laughs> but definitely a joyous time, amen? amen. Just, good, just good. I was just, my last sermon was at SAC. I think it was the 17th or 16th of uh, March. And uh, it has been pretty much exactly six months since we worshiped together. And uh, Melissa came for one Sabbath, then she was in lockdown. Cheryl, I've, uh, we forgot to introduce you, but yes, we do welcome you. It is not easy to, to transition from being six months at, or five months, or three months rather at DAC, and then now coming to SAC, but I'm thankful that she has um, been willing to serve here with us at SAC, and uh, you know, we have 15 Bible workers, you know, and God is good. He's been sustaining all of us, and the fact that we're here this morning together is a big testament to how good God is to all of us. As we are seeing the cases rise again, I think there is a bit of fear and trepidation in our hearts. But I know that the Lord knows what He's doing. Amen? Amen. It is so good to hear that. <laughs> it is so good to hear your feedback. Uh, just pray for me as I'm standing here that my ankle is going to be okay. But let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we get into the message, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us. And thank you, Father, that we have your word as a promise and an assurance that Jesus is still in control. And so, Lord, as we're about to open your word now, we ask for your presence. We ask for your leading. We ask for your guidance. And continue to be with those, O oh Lord, that are watching from home because of the lockdown. I just pray that you'd please grant them a Sabbath blessing as well. And please be with all of us. Teach us with thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn the me in your Bibles to first, pardon me, second Kings. Second Kings. And we're looking at verse chapter 6 and starting in verse 24. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. You know, Samaria and the, the children of Israel had been through famine before. And quite a number of times there had famine been coming through. And yet this sort of famine that, was about, that we're about to read about was not because of natural causes, but because Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, came and surrounded the children of Israel, and they were trapped. You couldn't go in, you couldn't go out, and basically they set up a city next to the city to starve you out 
in order to force you to surrender. And so we understand in verse 25 now what is taking place. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 25, the Bible says, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Can you believe that? First of all, the donkey was an unclean animal. It was not something that Israelites the Jews should have been eating. And they sold the donkey's head for 80 pieces of silver. Now, I did a little bit of research into this, and you know what? The donkey's head is the least amount of flesh. Already, the donkey could normally be bought for about... Um, where was it? It could be bought for about... Eight pieces of silver. So the whole donkey could be bought for about eight pieces of silver. We are talking about the donkey's head only that could be purchased for 80 pieces of silver. Not just that, bird dung. Okay, it says here in verse 25 that a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Can you imagine this? You know, prices went up exorbitant amount. You know, COVID has caused some of the prices of food. Do you realize that? To go up and there's nothing you can do about it, especially during the lockdown. And I don't think it's come back down since then. I'm not too sure. I don't do the grocery shopping in my household. I apologize. But Samaria was in a time of famine. Food was expensive, and people were getting desperate, willing to eat unclean food. They were willing to even eat bird poop. This is how desperate a time they're living in. And today, friends, we are living in a time of famine as well. Famine of the hearing of the Word of God, the Word of truth. And you know, friends, what's very interesting about famine is this that we see already from 2 Kings chapter 6 is this. When people are starving, they will eat anything. When people are starving, they will eat just about anything, not just physically, but even in the spiritual sense as well. And truly today, even in the churches, not just the other Protestant churches, but even in our dear Seventh-day Adventist church, sometimes anything goes, isn't it? And truth has been cast to the ground. There is a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. I even remember a religion teacher, a Bible teacher in the Seventh-day Adventist school. He was teaching Bible, and instead of teaching Bible, he would show the children horror movies and then he would have an ethical discussion about what was wrong about the movie. Do you see that, friends? That was about 10 years ago. We are facing also a famine today, and it seems like anything seems to go. But people are hungry for the Word of God. But let's continue. Verse 26. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor and out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. Can you imagine that? This is how desperate the times were that the people were living in. That the mother would not look upon her son with love. But with what? Desire to sustain herself. Even the mother's affection had changed, and this is how desperate the situation had become. Mothers, not mothers anymore. 
And this is why we seem to understand in Malachi, the very last verse of the Old Testament, where it says that Elijah, the work of Elijah, would be to turn the heart of the children to the fathers and the fathers back to the children. Could I dare say I would add the mother there as well? But there would be fracture, there would be separation in the home, and people separated, love drying up. And so we see that today. Society is being destroyed at the very core, even in the home. And so many homes where children are growing up, they're growing up with dysfunction, dysfunctional families. You know, I just watched this video recently and it talked about this man who lined up children at this line and says, we're going to have a hundred meter race. I don't know if you've seen this before. But then he then proceeds to call out questions. If you grew up with a mother and father, take two steps forward. If you grew up never having to worry about when the next meal will be placed on your table, take two steps forward. And at the end, you would see that there was a great separation between different people. And there highlighted a lot of dysfunction, a lot of problems, even within the home. Friends, this is a sort of society that we're growing up in. I remember when I was teaching in Taiwan, a private school. I would leave work about 5, 6 o'clock. School finished at 3 o'clock and there were kids still hanging around. It came to this point where we had to close the gates and the kids were sitting at the MRT, the train station. They had money. The parents lavished the money upon them, but they were never around. So the kids were left to take care of themselves and entertain themselves and then go home and sleep. You know, friends, we are living in a time where the Word of God itself is not finding in it into its heart of the hearers of the families. And as a result, families are breaking apart. Verse 29. And so he boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. When people are hungry, when they're desperate, they will do anything. And friends, in Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? It represents a church. And there are churches all over the world today, even here in Malaysia, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that people are starving for the Word of God and anything seems to go. Boundaries that are set out by the Word of God are ignored. Clean versus unclean. Eating your own children. People have gotten desperate. And so what, we, what, what have we done? We've turned to the pastors, we've turned to books, and we've tried to find truth in there. And we try to make up understanding of things that we seem to think are talking about the Bible. And they seem to not satisfy us. Because many people today are not preaching the truth. And so, I can learn just as much from a movie today. From the church itself, it seems, isn't it? And you know, in this story... Who suffered? When you look at this story about the mothers, who was the one that suffered? It was their children. It was the young people. And today we see that young people are leaving the churches in droves. Why? Because they're not getting fed. They're not getting fed. I still remember back... Uh, Maybe about 15 years ago, I was, I was at a church and, and, you know, after that they had their games and the pastor was saying, it's better that they're here than they're on the streets of New York. This is where the church was. And I agreed with him. But friends, the sure way to keep the children off the streets that are, that are dangerous today is not to give them entertainment in the church, but to give them the Word of God. Amen? This is what we got to give them. This is what we got to feed them. But churches all over the world are suffering for a want of the true Word of God. Friends, there's famine in the land today. There's famine. But what happens next? Let's turn our Bibles to chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. 
Then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thy thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Who was the prophet? Elisha. And he said, Tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour is going to be sold for a shekel. And the person that was listening in verse 2, he couldn't believe it. God would have to literally open the windows of heaven if this were to happen. Unbelievable statement. And you know, many of us don't realize how ridiculous or how, how crazy this statement might have sounded. So I want to direct your attention to the slide here. <clears throat> so in verse 1, he said that a measure of flour will be sold for what? A shekel, which was one piece of silver, okay? Now, if you go back to chapter 6 and verse 25, it said a quarter of a cab's dung was sold for five pieces of silver. And let's just make this comparison to help us to realize how outrageous Elisha's statement was to the person that was sitting there listening. So, one cab is one-sixth of a seer. This is what you will, it's a measurement, okay? Uh, just imagine it as kg or something like that. And one measure is one seer. Did you get that? So one cab, you need six cabs to make one measure. Do you understand that? And a quarter of a cab's dove's dung, one quarter, not one cab, okay, was sold for five pieces of silver. Therefore, one quarter cab is one twenty-fourth of a seer. Did you get, catch that? If you didn't do algebra in high school, you will not catch it. Okay? One cab is one sixth of a seer. One quarter of a cab is one twenty-fourth of a seer. Does that make sense? So, one measure of dove's dung, not one quarter of a cab, one measure, okay, one seer. If you wanted to buy one measure of dove's dung, it would be 120 pieces of silver. Compared to what Elijah is saying in chapter 7, he's saying one measure of flour, not just any flour. What did the Bible say here? Fine flour. This was the good flour. It would be sold for? one piece of silver. In other words, the day before, bird dung was 120 times more expensive than flour. Did you see that? Now, <clears throat> when you read the commentary, some people say the dove's dung wasn't really dung, it was just bad vegetable. Friends, I would eat bad, bad vegetable before I ate dung. It seems to suggest that it really was bird poop that they ate. And it was 120 times more expensive than what flour was going to be the next day. <clears throat> you don't realize how outrageous this statement is. So let me help you to understand it. <laughs> Durian, the best... I still think it's better than black thorn. And I don't know why, I'm losing my voice. Can I have my water bottle, please? <clears throat> Pardon me. If Musan King is sold for 40 per kilo, that's yesterday. And I told you that T tomorrow, it's going to be sold for 33 cents per kilo. Only people that lived in the 80s can understand this. This was what durian was sold for 40 years ago. Would you believe it? Now when you look at verse 2 of chapter 7, you will realize that the guy and his reaction, when he couldn't believe Elisha, 
he wasn't so unfaith-like. Do you get it? You don't think, oh. Now, when, when you read verse 2 by itself, you think, man, this guy has no faith. No faith in the prophet at all. <clears throat> but now when we bring it down to our real world understanding, we can have a bit of pity upon what the guy's reaction is, isn't it? But you know, friends, the question is, would we be like that guy standing there listening to Elisha? You know, Elisha was a prophet of peace. Elijah was more offensive, the prophet of war, it seems. But would we really believe Elisha? This man didn't. And Elisha said, because you're like this, you're not even going to eat the food tomorrow. Today, God has given us a prophet, a messenger. And it just seems right that our little mission spotlight, our, our, our video was talking about Ellen White. But you know, she's written a lot, a lot of outrageous things. I think she's made statements that some of us, we could never ever believe if it wasn't for science. You know, she was writing a hundred years ago that tobacco, over a hundred years ago, tobacco is an insidious poison when they were using it for treatment in the hospitals. It's like telling people today, Panadol is an insidious poison. She said some pretty outrageous stuff. In the book, Desire of Ages, she wrote that in Christ was life unborrowed, underived. And the people, the Adventists that read it a hundred years ago, they were blown away in their minds thinking, thinking, is this really true? To us, we can accept it today. It's become more normal. But she has, even in our day and age, if we were to go through all her writings, she has written things in there that I think many of us still cannot accept. And I wonder how many of us would react like that man that was standing next to Elisha when he made this statement that a measure of fine flour would be sold for just one piece of silver. Whereas the day before, one measure of bird dung was sold for 120 pieces of silver. You know, friends, some people just can't accept Ellen White. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about other churches. I'm talking about our denomination. We like to cry out the Bible and the Bible only when she says something that we don't believe in. Or we like to condemn any preachers that mention her writings. I'm not giving any quotes today. We like to pit her against Moses against Paul or even John. And we like to say such things that, you know, the Bible is here and she is here. Say such things. But you know, friends, I have one thing for you to, 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 to meditate on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Paul says, Now I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Paulus, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Ellen White crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Ellen White? No, right? She is just a prophet in our midst to point us to our Savior. Just as all the prophets did. No matter how outrageous a statement they made. You know when John the Baptist, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Do you realize how unbelievable a statement he made? What? God is walking amongst us? Are you serious? If prophets 
are to bring present truth. They will always make statements that will shock us. But let's continue. <clears throat> I think I got too excited and too used to preaching in front of a camera. I literally am losing my voice. Pray for me. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? What does leprosy represent in the Bible, friends? Sin. Four sinners sitting at the gate, and their limbs are falling off, their eye is falling off, their ears are falling off, they're, they're, they're rotting, they're smelly, and they said, Why are we just sitting here? Verse 4. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. And we shall die there. And if we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, then we'll die. So they were pretty intelligent. They, they might have leprosy, but they were smart. Maybe one was a lawyer, the other one was a businessman, the other one an engineer, the other one a pastor. You know, pastors are intelligent too, you know. <laughs> but they had pretty good logic. If we go into the city, we're going to die. We're sitting here, I'm going to die. Let's just go there. At the worst, we die. Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they come into the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and did what? Did what? Hid it. You know, <clears throat> let's put the spiritual application on it. The sinners come into the camp. They discover that they can eat and drink. There's bread and wine or water. They discover the Word of God. They discover the fountain of living water. Or the blood of Jesus that is enough to wash away their sins. Then they find silver, which is understanding in the book of Proverbs. They discover gold, which is what? Faith. And then they also have the raiment, which represents righteousness. And what do they do? They go and hide it. They go and hide it. You know, friends, I believe that God has given us understanding in the Word of God. I believe that God has given us rich treasure in Jesus Christ. I believe that God has given us gold, faith, rich in love as well. But many of us, we've made the mistake like these lepers. And instead of using this blessing to go and bless the world, we go and hide it. We go and take it home and keep the treasure to ourselves. And many of us, we hide Jesus. We hide His blessings. We keep His blessings for ourselves. And we forget, just as God promised to Abraham, that I want to bless you, so that you can what? Bless others. We forget that the blessing that God gives us should be for others, and we hoard it to ourselves. You know, friends, when you read the Bible many times, Spiritual blessings is connected with material blessings. Not always, 
There are poor people in the Bible. There are those that never, ever made it rich. There were beggars that will be saved. But you know, we always, more often than not, see that spiritual blessings is accompanied by physical blessing. And many of us, we come week in, week out. We've been listening to a lot of sermons. I'm surprised you're still here. You're not sick of me. All you do is listen to Ben on the weekends and it gets kind of boring and tough, isn't it? But it's easy to hide the truth and not share it. We forget. We get caught up with life. And we just think that God wants to bless me because I've been faithful. But it's not that. Because He causes the sun to rise on the good and the bad. He causes the rain to come down on the good and the bad. He wants to give this for everybody. Not just ourselves. My question for you this morning as we're pondering this story is, what are you doing with the truth that you hear? What are you doing with the, the truth that you're gaining from week to week? How has your personal devotions benefited your neighbor? Or is it just, thank God, you have kept me safe? God, if it wasn't for me reading the Bible, I would have had COVID. If it wasn't for me reading the Bible, I would be dead or I'll be homeless out on the street. But how has the Word of God influenced you to be a blessing to somebody else? Verse 9. Then said they one to another, We do not well. We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. You know, they came to their senses and they said, we don't do well by just keeping the blessing to ourselves. This is not good. We do not well. And they said, this day is a day of what? Good tidings. Friends, do you know what another word for good tidings is? Gospel. If we keep the gospel to ourselves, the good news, the good tidings, we do not well if we're just holding it and we hold our peace. And then he says what? If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. You know, I'm reminded of Ezekiel 33. When you see your brother in sin and you don't say anything, and that person dies in their sin, God holds us accountable. You know, at the end of time, when the mark of the beast comes in, and then God, shortly after that, pours out His plagues, and the people that turn around and look at you, they said, how come you know? How come you knew about this? How come you didn't tell us? God will hold us accountable for the light that we know. We do not well. That if we hold back the good news, the good glad tidings, the gospel, some mischief will come upon us, friends. It will be to our own hurt if we hoard up God's treasures and don't distribute it to those that need it most. We do not well. But then they say what? Now therefore come, that we may go. He didn't say, uh, okay, I nominate one, you go. We'll pray for you. They didn't say that. They said, therefore now come, that we may go. Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord. Let me be the one that will go. And it's those that have attempted much for God that have actually accomplished much for God, friends. We can't accomplish much for God by sitting there and just simply praying. 
we got to be willing to go and share the good news. I hope that you can line up at the lunch table there where Cassidy is sitting. And say, Cass, please, let me preach next week. <laughs> I wish Cassidy would do that too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Lord, let me be the one that will share the glad tidings. I know maybe some of you are shy saying, oh, if I go to Cass, th then he might think I'm proud or th that I want to share a message. But friends, we've got to be willing. God, send me. If you're too shy, then go, God, please, let Cassidy's heart be touched that he will ask me to preach. You know what I mean? I wish we had more teachers. I wish we had more preachers. Lord, send me. Let me go to share the good news. Let me be the one that will give somebody that is thirsting, that is hungering for the word of God and for the truth. God, please let me be that one. Peter, when he stood before the, the Pharisees, after Jesus had resurrected, after the Pentecost had come down, the Pharisees thought that peace, Peter was still this weak man, easy to be influenced. And so they, they threatened him and they, they beat them. And Peter said this in Acts 4.20, I cannot but speak the things which I have seen and heard. He became a courageous man now. He was willing to share the word of God. He was brave to share the word of God because he had had a conversion experience with Jesus Christ. It's because he saw the King of Kings, because he spent time in the word of God and the word of God was the thing that gave him the platform to stand upon that he was willing to preach the truth even at the cost of his own life. Friends, God really blessed the Israelites. Do you know that? God fought for them. He provided for them. He made them a fruitful plant. But what happened? They hoarded all these things. They built up walls and said, stay away from us, you wicked people. But then when they went out, they went out with not the interaction and the idea to share the gospel, but they went out for the idea for gain. Solomon, he married all these wives for political gain. He didn't do it because he wanted the conversion of their hearts and their lives. He did it so that they could give him more resources to make him the richest um, king in the whole world. And many of us today, we're still going out, doing our businesses, doing our studies, all for the thought that I need to support myself. And we've lost the understanding of God's blessing for us. He doesn't want to bless you just so that you can have a comfortable life and that's it. He wants to bless us so that we can go. Amen? The one with the most resources should be the ones that say, Lord, let me go. But usually it's the ones with the least resources that say, God, all I can give you is my life. I'll go. Isn't it? But these four men, ready to die, they said, we do not well this day. If we keep these blessings to ourselves. We do not well if we hoard to ourselves the riches of, of God's grace. Some of you have been blessed with health and strength. Make sure you use that for the glory of God. Don't forget that your health is a gift from God, not Dr. Sean. Some of you are doing this 10 day challenge thing. God will accept the most sick of people to work for Him. Ellen White was such a person. She attempted much for the Lord and thus she was able to accomplish much for Him. Others have the blessing of money and means. Make sure that is used for the glory of God. Paul, he was a tent maker. Do you know that? 
And he wasn't just making any old tent. This man made such tents that all he had to do was work part time. And not only did he support himself, he supported other churches and other people. Still others have the blessing of intellect to plan for God's work and not just for their studies and their business. We need more such people on the church board and in our leadership teams to plan and to, to, to talk about God's work and figure out how to move forward and then come to pray together and ask God to bless. Whatever talent we have, friends, we must use it for the Lord's work and for His glory. Let's not hoard all these things to ourselves. Friends, if there's one thing that COVID has taught me is that we can't anticipate, anticipate when the world will change. You know, as I've been sitting here and, and, and we, we, we always talk about the signs of the times, isn't it? But overnight, our, our life changed back in March. And don't you think something so serious as the mark of the beast, Satan would not want it to go just as quickly? We can't say, God, I'll get my life ready when I see that the political powers are coming together with the church. We can't say that anymore, friends. COVID has taught me that we could wake up tomorrow and the world will be different. We're already living in a new normal, aren't we? And make many of us, maybe we're going back learning for the old normal, trying to make life as normal as possible for our children, for our friends, for our family, for our parents. But there has to be a new normal today for us. There has to be a reprioritization of Jesus in our life. For stronger devotions and a walk with God, a more intimate love for our Savior, a fuller surrender to Jesus. There has to be a more passionate piety for His work and a deeper devotion to His cause and more sacrificial service. Friends, as our doors to the church have reopened again, let us refocus. Let's grow this church. Let's impact our community. Let's tell our neighbors about Jesus Christ. At the very worst, they'll look at us at us funny, and then we'll look back at them funny. But friends, it's time for Jesus to take a bigger priority in our lives, isn't it? Let's not go back to our old selves, but let's be a born-again Christian. Let's be a new creature created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Let us be like Jesus this day. And so as we stand for our closing song, I want to invite our, our leaders to come and lead us in our closing song. My Jesus, I love thee. Let that be the cry of our heart that God would give us an even deeper love for him today. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing.
there's ever a time that we got to have the love of Jesus burning in our hearts, it's now. If there's ever a time that we got to make sure of our Savior and our salvation, it's today. If there was ever a time to tell Jesus, and even our neighbors, how much Christ loves them, today's the day. Let us make that recommitment. In the rest of this year, let's not forget so soon what we've been through, but let us push forward and grow from that and allow Jesus to shine through our hearts and we be willing to say, God, here I am. Send me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would please be with all of us here. I know, Lord, that none of us are worthy, but Jesus is. And you have chosen us. You've set us apart. You've clothed us with your robe of righteousness. You've blessed us with spiritual blessings. And now you're telling us, my son, my daughter, will you share that glad tidings with somebody else? Oh, Father, I pray that your love would touch our hearts, that it would burn deep in us, that we can just answer as Peter did, Lord, you know. Lord, you know. And so, Father, here is our heart. We give it to you today. Fill it with all your glory. Fill it with your spirit. Fill it with your love. Fill it with your passion for the world that is dying and lost in sin. And so, Lord, help us to go forward in faith with Jesus by our side this day. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.